back with us, Jason Forgers. Sounds like we're on the air, and that's great. I like to walk when I'm giving my talk. I was wondering if you could dim the house lights, um, it, or not. Would be the other option, of course. Um, we could do, you know, either one. Um, in any case, uh, today I'm going to be talking about um, our experience as chasers as we move around and go to different locations. Um, we bring with us all of our health problems and introduce others. So, trying to stay safe in this hobby, Dr. Doswell talked about strategically in terms of chasing yesterday that a lot of the things that we do and how we go about chasing are inherently unsafe. This is an unsafe hobby. However, there are other things we do which are even more unsafe that we do to ourselves. Um, and that's what I want to kind of talk about a little bit today. Um, and so we'll cover the gamut from, from bed bugs to chasing addiction. Which is really good. You know, it's a lot of fun when you're on a live stream. Watch this. Watch the camera. There you go. See, not bad. Not bad. Okay. You got a bob and weave. That's what I've learned. Excellent. All right. Bob and weave for high quality productions. All right. So, I've got a shamelessly ambitious agenda, as is very typical of me. I usually have more things there than I can possibly talk about. And I asked Roger for most of today and some of tomorrow, but he limited me to just an hour. Unfortunately, I didn't know I'd be upstaged by a lottery system that <clears throat> didn't work so well. All right, so we're going to talk about some of the most common chasing related illnesses. We're going to talk about bed bugs for those of you who are squeamish. Uh, I'm going to enjoy watching your faces. Okay, so um, we'll talk about sleep deprivation and caffeine addiction because this is very important here. Especially for some of you, I should add, and hungover, listening to a doctor talk at Sunday morning at 8.15. This just proves how sick we all are, right? Um, we'll talk about long distance and distracted driving, um, blood clots and speeding. Um, and then we'll also talk about some of the inherent dangers and chasing storms that, from the medical aspect as opposed to the technical aspects. We'll talk about thunderstorm related injury, and also about PTSD. And then we'll address the big elephant in the room, supercell deprivation syndrome, <laughs> versus chasing addiction, and they are very different. Um, uh, and then we'll do a rain wrap up. Uh, okay, some of them are going to work, folks, some of them aren't. You're paying to be here, I don't really care either way. Glad you missed out and coming here. <laughs> anyway, so moving along. All right. Um, so just to, to preface this, let me talk about this. Um, and and we'll, yeah, it's going to be good because I can't wait to talk about this. So many people over the years have said that uh, Jeff Piotrowski was full of stuff. I can assure you that after having done a thorough exam on Mr. Piotrowski, he is uh, not as full as you think he is. <laughs> About 50-50. Um, uh, the problem is getting him to stay in one place long enough to actually do the exam that I was trying to do. Uh, he's usually on the phone and he's, you know, he's moving around. He's got a lot of energy. But in any case, I, it's that thorough. That's what I offer to you. It's a free service, which is a medical advisory hotline. There's not a lot I can do over the phone um, uh, except spiritual healing and incantations. <laughs> A little bit. Um, but no, uh, I can help you if you need help, you want to know where to go, want to get some advice. I offer this freely, that's my cell phone. You can call 24 7. I generally won't answer 24 7, but I will reply uh, within the day if I can. And it is just a service that I offer to us because we're all going to do this together and I want us all to be safe and healthy and happy. Except for Jack. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> all right, so. All right, let's get started on my favorite topic, bed bugs. Just absolutely the grossest things in the world. They're little brown, wingless, flat, two to five millimeter long things. They look a lot like apple seeds. And, and the, the reality is bed bugs, if you can believe it, were nearly eradicated at the end of World War II. Isn't that great? And then we go along and we move them from place to place so that they can continue to proliferate. So the reality is that bed bugs were nearly gone, they were scourged, they usually used to occur in the impoverished classes and not so much seen in upscale uh, living, which is why it, like lice and uh, scabies, 
are still considered to be sort of like the leprosy of the modern era. The reality is that now every institution is at risk of getting bed bugs, and, and including some of the highbrow places you wouldn't normally think. Um, they like to dine on people and pets, and for their life cycle, they need to do this every three to five days. But here's where it's a real kicker. They can hang out for a year without a blood meal. One year, which means just avoiding the room you see them in, you'll have to just sell the house. <laughs> so so it's, it's really bad. Here's the life cycle, which is as disgusting as it looks. And um, they just get bigger and bigger, and then they do this sort of thing for you. Here's what a bed bug looks like. This is from the University of Kentucky. It starts off as a little thing, and then it, you know, gets in there and it sucks your blood and fills up juice. <laughs> is it just me, or am I the only one appreciating this? I, I just, yeah, okay, I've got one other person. That's fantastic. All right, good. Yeah, oh! I just want you to be informed. That's all I want. <laughs> and I enjoy watching what happens. So, uh, all right. So bed bugs are there. They're a real pest. And, they, and the problem with them is they cause an itching-like illness. In rare circumstances, patients can have a full-out allergic reaction to the bed bugs, which can also include asthma and, um, and other itching diseases. By and large, they don't cause much in the way of problems, but it could take up to 11 days, i.e. for me, one chase season, to actually manifest symptoms. So you may have a hard time bringing them back to figuring out when this occurred. Um, so they, in a, what I'm sure is a sense of humor sort of deal, uh, several scientists have actually uh, described their meal pattern as breakfast, lunch, dinner bites. And that just is enough to make me puke. Um, and I'll show you that in a minute. And, um, and this, this is it. There you go. There's breakfast. This is actually apparently a buffet. Uh, breakfast, lunch, dinner. Uh, a couple of bed bugs out in the town, you, and uh, they did that. And they caused that, these sorts of issues. They differ from flea bites um, uh, in a number of different ways. We won't go into that too much, except to say that um, uh, typically the bed bugs are going to be in clustered bites, uh, whereas flea bites will be elsewhere in the body. Scabies, incidentally, is typically seen on the hands and also can be seen in the groin or on the breasts, um, which is enough to make anyone All right, so um, theoretically, bed bugs, which have been sampled, can carry hepatitis B and C. They can carry HIV. They can carry other forms of diseases, including one that's really a scourge right now called methicillin-resistant Staphylococcus aureus. And MRSA is uh, easily transmitted from person to person. It's a highly antibiotic resistant form of staph infection. Now, no documented cases have ever been shown that, in fact, bed bugs are a vector for this. In other words, they may have them in them, but they may not transmit them. But it's enough spooky that I just assume not have bugs that have more diseases and so you won't go share diseases. I don't want to share diseases with bugs. I really don't. Uh, so I'd like not to have them happen. They are very hard to get rid of when you get rid of them. Under the best of circumstances, you might have a 97% chance of eradication. That's under the best of circumstances. And remember, these guys can hide for a year uh, without having to eat. But more commonly, is 90% success rate, which means that if you look to your left and you look to your right and you keep doing this, uh, no, that analogy won't work. But in any case, it, you know, it's very hard to correct if you don't want to take these things home with you. Um, and I should mention that in, as chasers like to jimmy up things themselves, I do want to mention that annually there's about 110 cases of people getting poisoned by trying to poison the bed bugs, sort of self-defeating. You know, to kill yourself to get out of the gene pool so that you don't get bitten seems a little extreme. <laughs> um, so what we really need to focus on with the bed bug storage is that we need to have a preventative strategy not to get them. And the most important thing to know is they fear light. So if you can just light up every aspect of your house forever, you should be fine. For the rest of us, that's not a very good strategy. They like to hide in crevices and cracks and creeks. They like to get in uh, uh, creases on the, uh, on the mattresses. Um, and one of the places they love to jump a ride, our luggage. And our luggage has tons of crevices. If you have like a photo, like, you know, I usually have my photography, my, my computer bag, all of that stuff in with me. That just 
fantastic for them. They really love that. But they also suck at dealing with smooth surfaces. So tile is a really great example. So is linoleum. And so one of the best things that I can tell you to do, which I am now going to do for the rest of my life, is when you go into a hotel to stay, I saw all of you are sitting here going, where did I put my luggage in there? <laughs> You're like, oh, I put it up against that beautiful drapery that's got lots of nooks and crannies. And you put them in the uh, bathtub, in the bathroom of the hotel, and that makes it very difficult because bed bugs won't go there. Um, you need to do inspections of your bed, and the things that you're going to be looking for are uh, little uh, fecal trails. Um, they usually tell you, which is nice. And the way you have to do that is you have to actually lift the mattress and take a look under the mattress. It's where they hang out at night. Um, if you see little blood spots or fecal trails of other people who visited this hotel, um, you know that there's probably bed bugs there, and you are well advised not to go in there and do anything about it. For those of you who are curious, there is a registry called bedbugregistry.com. You can look at hotels. And including the ones that we end up in, Bogotas Chasers. Um, it's not uncommon for us to get to different places. But keep in mind, this is not a question of the budget motel versus the fancy five-star hotel. Um, so Four Seasons, Broadmoor, they've all had bed bugs. Um, they are much better at eradicating them, but it's not like you're going to be more likely to draw them in a hotel six than you are um, going to you know, a fancy hotel. Uh, for the record, I did look up this hotel. Isn't it great? The day after you guys got here, um, I thought I would have to provide you information. There was a bed bug sighting one time, and that was over a year ago. So, pretty good likelihood that that's it. Um, so, there's very little likelihood of bed bugs here. It's in 129. There's also cameras in there, so don't get it. Bed bugs are, you see that they really are enjoying the northeast corner of the United States. Um, now, how about treating them so that you don't get them? Other bed bug prevention? Well, again, bed bugs hate light. They um, uh, hate flat, smooth, flat surfaces. Um, and in addition to that, you can uh, do what my colleague, Dr. Bill Hart, does, my fellow storm chaser. Um, he cooks his clothes. Um, and so there are several ways to cook your clothes. One of them, it, 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 and he's still not been bitten by a bed bug, so that's a good sign. Um, yeah, you guys are going to be telling your kids, you know, when you're talking to them, don't let the bed bugs, oh, shh, get out of your bed. Get out of your bed. Oh, my God. Is that fecal trails? And your child will be traumatized. I'm really glad I can bring this to you. You can get this thing called Pactite, and the Pactite basically cooks your clothes and your belongings at 120 degrees for several hours, and that has been shown to be completely effective in eradicating bed bugs. For those of us who don't want to spend the $3.99 that such a solution poses, you can put them on the hot, hottest hot water setting in your washer, and then you need them to at least be in the dryer a few cycles to get rid of them. In addition, you can freeze them and kill them, which is great if you're, like, say, in Chicago this year. No bed bugs outside, you know, so that's good. Yeah, so, that sucks. Um, anyway, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sorry. You guys have really gotten screwed by the polar. Yeah, this is sort of coming home to roost. We chase cyclones and then they do this. It's terrible. All right, so now that we've all creeped out about that, I just want to take it's sort of like when you smell the coffee beans when you're getting perfume or, you know, I'm going to cleanse your palate, just a few storm pictures, just to kind of. There we go. Let me move on to the next topic. All right, so I'm going to talk about several chaser common illnesses. And um, one of them. <laughs> Now, what's fascinating, and I just want you to know this, this is even cooler than you can believe. So this is Alsep's, as we all know. These are all the Alsep's locations in the United States. Where's Tornado Alley? There's Tornado Alley! Convection provided by Mother Nature. Alright, so, anyway, also we do make some bad food choices when we're on, when we're on the roads. And depending on how long you're out chasing, that can actually have a great impact on levels of cholesterol. You're diabetic, getting your diabetes out of control. We do a lot of things when we're chasing. And I just want you to be mindful of what you're eating. Sometimes you don't have a choice. Sometimes you do. And it would be good to try and just get an occasional meal in there that has some vegetable matter. Um, just throwing that out there. Um, then I want to also point out hand hygiene, which is often overlooked. 
Now, recent studies have looked at uh, whether or not antibacterial soaps actually provide antibacterial coverage. And the answer is probably not. Antibacterial soaps do not provide as much coverage against bacteria as we once thought. Um, and we'll sort of see how that all pans out. But I can tell you that the hand sanitizers are effective at getting rid of almost all germs. Um, and that's really, really good news um, because you need that. So I recommend highly that you have a hand sanitizer bottle in your car with you. Now, the places where chasers don't think they need to sanitize their hands, you probably do need to have it sanitized. When you fuel up at the pump, you know, whenever you handle money. Um, I spend a lot of time handling money by giving it to others while on the road <laughs> as I you know, continue to pay for the chasing vacation. But you know, when you're handling money and when you're filling up at the pump, those are two areas that are really important. And I won't even go into the bathroom situation, but I think you all know what I'm talking about there, too. It's very important to decrease disease transmission. Um, especially because we're going to be doing other things for ourselves, so we're going to put us in a position to be more likely to get sick on the road. So now we're going to talk about the biggest risk, um, and that is long haul driving. And I put up here, because I don't want you to think that I'm telling you guys what to do, that I don't need to learn from this myself. Putting this talk together is very insightful for me. Uh, and over the years, as I've gotten older, I've recognized that I have to alter my chase behaviors in order to stay safe on the road. I'm by no means accusing anybody of, of needing to change their lives. I just want you guys to take a moment and take in what that information I'm going to give you to make a decision for yourself. There's nothing right or wrong. But on average, I chase a pretty staggering number of miles um, annually. And I usually do that in a nine, uh, sometimes if I'm lucky, 13 day period. And when it works out, it works out to up to a 500 miles a day, which is a staggering amount. Um, and what are the effects of long-haul driving on, on people? Well, one of them is, and this is the macro-scale portion of chasing, one of them is a risk of DVT. And I want to comment on that briefly because, in fact, one of the more common calls I get on the chase hotline is regarding DVT and smokehosts. What happens is when you're seated for a while, driving or by air, actually air travel is a bigger risk because change in pressure in the cabin has some weird effects on your clotting system. You can develop clots in the lower extremities. These blood clots occur spontaneously, though some people have a predilection to getting these clots. When they form, the clot itself can make a varicose vein oh so much worse for the rest of your life. But worse, those clots can break off, travel upstream, and go to the lungs, causing something we call a pulmonary embolism. Pulmonary embolism can be fatal. It's a fatal illness in some people. Most of the time, it just maims people. But by and large, if you're driving long haul and you develop swelling in one of both legs that's new, that's a big risk that you may have a DVT. These DVTs are very treatable, and you want to treat them in the DVT stage. Because treating them once they get to the pulmonary embolism stage, some of that damage that pulmonary emboli can cause can be permanent. Um, so if you like your lungs and you like breathing, I've always been very fond of it. I get a chance to do that at 12 times a minute just to make sure that I'm still alive. You need to consider that DVT is an actual risk factor. Things that increase the likelihood of DVT are the longer period of time you're in the car and not getting up to stretch. Now, I've been on many heated chases where I am pretty much in the car, re-navigating, not getting out of the car. But the best recommendation we have in medicine is about every 90 minutes to two hours, you need to get up and take five minutes to get up and stretch. And that really is the way to get that blood circulating. Alternatively, you could go to like Walgreens, Walmart, whatever, and you can get what are called TED hooks. And these are, uh, it's T-E-D, all capitalized, which stands for thromboembolizing, thromboembolism stockings. They're did, did, I don't spell stockings with D, but you know what I'm saying. They're called TED hooks. I have no idea what the D stands for. It really is disturbing. But the TED hooks basically are, are compression stockings that will help keep the blood pumping out of the lower extremities and they may be very effective. If you have ever had a blood clot in your life and you are chasing storms, you need to talk to your physician, because that may not be enough. If you've ever been diagnosed with a DVT and you're chasing, it is a big, big risk. You do not want to do that without talking to your physician. You can talk to me too, if you wish. All right, um, so what about sleep, sleep deprivation? As I speak to an entire panel of people who appear sleep deprived. And I do appreciate you guys attending, I really did. When Roger said, we'll put you on Sunday morning, I knew that Roger was mad at me for some reason. <laughs> so, so, I did, I mean, I don't know what I did, but I'm very 
sorry, sir. All right. <laughs> now, I want to put this into the terms um, that are very easy to understand. And these are data that have been reproduced across multiple studies. It turns out that being sleep deprived with as little as 18 to 24 hours of continuous wakefulness can result in having the equivalent deficit in your reaction time to that of being drunk, 0.05% blood alcohol level. When they measure reaction speed, being able to intellectually take in the situation, being able to respond to sudden and unexpected changes of things, is no different than that. And while many times we are not on the road for 18 to 22 hours, which is a relief, it turns out that short periods of sleep over a period of several days results in the same defect, the same defect. And I'm guilty of this. I have driven like a madman and then tried to make it up with little naps while we're waiting for convection to brew. It's not effective. It's not effective. And what's scary is that if you look at it, Colorado uh, driving while ability is impaired is 0.05%. And if you are so sleep deprived, you may take a DWAI test. It does not require you to be intoxicated. So in some, I know what the other state laws are, but I want to share that because that's a little mellow. Um, and DUI is 0.08% for those adults over the age of 21. Um, now, fatigue can be augmented by caffeine. Caffeine is not the solution to doing long-haul driving. Now, it is a good short-term solution. But it turns out that as you continue to add caffeine to caffeine to caffeine, you actually increase the likelihood of becoming impaired as a driver. You become much more accurate in your thinking, but you still suffer the fatigue of not being able to do rapid tasks, such as reaction time, repetitive, uh, or you know, uh, uh, being able to break in time. So the fatigue still exists, it's just your thought processes and how you feel get better. Um, it turns out low-dose caffeine, low-dose caffeine, such as what you can provide, for example, in the soda over a period of time, is better for you than the energy drinks. Better for you than the energy drinks. Um, not that I'm advocating soda drinking. Now, I, I drink boatloads of soda, so there's no hypocrisy here or anything. But, you know, I want to, I'm trying to get you to see my point of view, so I'll be ready. Um, all right. Now, distracted driving may even further augment the likelihood of inability to perform tasks. Now, do I drive distracted? Me? What? Oh, I mean, there's roads that are twisting and bunches of other drivers. I'm trying to keep track on GR level 3 where I am relative to the storm. There's a cow. Um, uh, there's, uh, there's my ham radio, and I'm trying to communicate with the other guys in my caravan. Meanwhile, I'm also taking into account geographic effects. A lot of new chasers don't recognize that the geography of where you're chasing matters a hell of a lot in your strategy. There is nothing that sucks more than finding out that one east-west escape route you have hits a river. Um, that really sucks. <laughs> I know. Um, so, you know, there's that. And then there's also the possibility that roads could wash out. Um, so knowing your geography, knowing what your options are, what your escape options are, that's there. So I'm constantly trying to pay attention to what's going to be my option in the future. Um, and then there's my cell phone is going off. Did you see that? I'm getting a text. My God, look at this monster tornado. I'm just half a mile ahead of you, and I'm in the murk. And you go, oh, it's just terrible. Um, and then, you know, there's railroad crossings, construction, construction. Um, need I say any more? Uh, there's another cow. Um, and, uh, you know, there's no weather radio going on trying to tune all these things. Um, and then in the process of all of this, there's also me thinking about my forecast. I'm checking my forecast maps. And then there may be a tornado in the, in the rope stage about to barrel down on me. So I'm, this is what I'm juggling? S sleep deprived? Bad idea. <laughs> so really bad idea. So over the years, what I'm trying to do more is when I need to make a decision and pull over. It takes me 10, 30 seconds to make a decision, look at data, and interpret what's going on, and I pull over. Because if I'm trying to do this while I'm amped up on caffeine, <laughs> sleep deprived, I'm going to make a mistake. And a mistake can be my life. Um, worse, it can be someone else's life. We've all been on chases lately, I'm sure, especially if you're in Oklahoma, oof, where people are so desperate to get to the storm. 
they will mow you the hell over. They will travel the wrong way on a one-way road. They will do whatever they can to get there. And that's not, and, and I'll explain that in a minute. They're not bad people. They're making really horrific decisions. But what I want to comment on is we are not safe when we're driving with all of our technology. And we're not doing it for sleep deprived. Um, I'm just saying, that's something you need to factor in. And look at your own behavior and say, you know, what could I do to be safer uh, while I'm out there? And these are the sorts of things. There's no easy solution, or at least not for me, I haven't found one. But I bring this up just so we can think about this. All right, so now let's talk a little bit more about sleep deprivation uh, by talking about caffeine. Um, so caffeine, um, so we have a lady carrying roughly the correct size cup of coffee in the morning, and we have another lady who is getting an infusion of Coca-Cola. I certainly respect the lab. All right, now, um, I want to mention that the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Psychiatry, Revision 5, was just published, and it actually defines caffeine withdrawal as a psychiatric illness and caffeine intoxication as a psychiatric illness. And I'm fascinated by that, but I was too amped up to read. So, uh, <laughs> so I'm just going to give you the bullet points, uh, as I understand them. I want to talk about the intoxication because it's particularly interesting to me, um, and, and it's kind of cool. So basically, um, <clears throat> greater than 300 milligrams of caffeine per day is basically it. Anyone want to guess what like, an espresso has? 300 milligrams of caffeine? You know, how about those energy drinks? 300 milligrams of caffeine. Pepsi? How about 50 milligrams of caffeine? <laughs> Not me rationalizing, right? But yes, it's actually true. Most sodas don't contain that much caffeine. But the coffees, the energy drinks, those contain both of those. If you're drinking 300 milligrams a day, you may want to check the label. It does tell you how many milligrams of caffeine are there. Because you may also suffer from this. Um, if you have greater than five of these symptoms, you may, you may suffer from caffeine intoxication. So, restlessness, um, uh, we've got, if my brain doesn't work fast enough, nervousness, excitement, uh, irritability, anxiety, GI upset, um, muscle twitching, random speech, basically everything you're seeing in front of you right now, except I've been content of school, um, and then flushing, uh, insomnia, and an irregular heartbeat. Now, what's interesting is, if you have greater than or equal to five of these, and it's interfering with your life. So you may not actually feel like it's interfering with your life when you're riding a high of caffeine. But how many of you have, you don't have to raise your hand, how many of you have sleep problems? How many of you get really anxious on a chase day? Right? Yeah, I mean, I, I get anxious. I do. There's a lot of writing in it, right? There's not. But we think there is. And some of these could be fueled by caffeine. And, and you may say, oh, no, I've drank this forever. I, I don't get affected by caffeine. The reason it's included in the DSM-5 is because some people have such disabling side effects of caffeine, they don't know it's the caffeine. They don't know it's the caffeine. So I, I posit that because it's an important thing to look at. Um, now, incidentally, in addition to that, they have caffeine withdrawal. Caffeine withdrawal is almost the exact same symptoms, <laughs> um, except that it, mean, it can start off as little as nine hours after your last drink of coffee. Nine hours. So usually people are waking up in withdrawal, and that's why you need a little bit to take the edge off. And then uh, it can take up to 11 days if you decide to go cold turkey on caffeine. It can take 11 days to detox from caffeine. I'm not saying that it's bad. It's not interfering with your life. Caffeine's great. It really is. If you're having side effects of the caffeine, it's something to look at. Just something to look at. All right, so let's talk about thunderstorm injury. Um, I'm going to talk about uh, most of the things that we already know. First thing I want to say is that lightning is the most deadly of storm injuries. Okay? It, it's the least predictable, and as we all know, it can strike way away from the storm. And I get out of my car, I film with a tripod, and usually like with a tape. Uh, so, you know, <laughs> I, I, I don't know why I'm, I'm so hooked on the kite. But anyway, um, we don't actually know what the full extent of lightning injuries are. There's been a few chasers I know have been struck more than one time. There's different types of currents that can occur. Um, but it's important to know that one out of every four people struck will die. And one of the things that increases the likelihood of dying 
is if you're chasing a lion. If you're off lone wolfing and you get struck, there's no one to do CPR on you. And that's it. Boom. Life over. One of the safety things I encourage you to think about is stay chasing more than one person. That's really, really important. Um, that's true for a variety of reasons. If you get in a car accident, you know, whatever else. Um, and <laughs> to the women, this won't be surprising. It's typically men who get struck. Why? Because you get out of their cars and it's light and it's light. <laughs> um, all right, so, you know, that's what happens. Um, so, there's some stuff here down here just talking about the difference in the and current. But really what you need to know is this is a very serious injury when you get it. And nobody gets out of being struck by lightning without getting something for the rest of their lives out of it. Um, direct contact with a bolt will result in 50,000 amps, which is more than the body can take. Um, and so it actually splashes around you like a liquid almost, and can spread out from you. Um, and it will, usually lightning will spread, spread out almost like the ripples of a pond. Uh, because it turns out the ground is not a great ground. <laughs> it's just better at handling the electrical current than you are. Um, so it's not a great ground, and wherever it can get a shortcut through your body, it will do so. And the shortcuts that lightning favors are anything that has a hole in it. So your skull has multiple holes in it. Your eyes, your ears, your mouth, your nose. Yeah, and then further south into the nether <laughs> Um, and that's where it goes to get a shortcut down to the ground. Um, and it can cause significant thermal injury because the temperature can raise up to briefly to 30,000 degrees Kelvin, which is a little warm. Somebody asked me once, well, what's that in Fahrenheit? <laughs> 65. I mean, <laughs> it's a lot of damn energy, is what I'm telling you. It doesn't really matter. Um, there's also indirect current, which is probably the most common form of lightning injury experience with chasers. If you have one leg closer than the other leg to a lightning bolt that strikes near you, you will become a favored current pathway. The ground does not absorb electricity as well as you think it does. It can travel up one leg and out the other. Um, so that's called a step current. That's what kills most cows from lightning. Um, uh, if they only learn to just balance on one foot, they'd be fine. Um, um, and then there's also side flash. So immediately we can talk about cardiopulmonary arrest from the stunning that occurs. Um, and we often employ a reverse triage. The person who's making the least amount of noise is the person you have to go to first, whereas typically in most crash situations it's reversed. Um, and then there can be some delayed and progressive things that happen. This is a lightning bolt injury from New England Journal. Um, and what you see is there's little holes in this guy's toes. That's because those damn rubber soles on our shoes. Don't conduct electricity with the dam, so the lightning's got to shoot out through the toes to arc to the ground. And so there's exit patterns on the toes themselves. Um, there's also ferning, and this is an example of ferning. This is a fulgurate, which is just basically what electricity does in this particular substance. I, mean, I can't remember if this is glass or not. And ferning also occurs on people. So here's a lightning strike victim who you can sort of get an idea of where the lightning struck. Um, had he been close to the ground, it would have exited here and around the front. Um, and then it causes the same sort of things. It also does it to golf courses, which is just kind of cool. All right. Um, long term, uh, and the patients can have progressive and severe chronic illnesses that occur because of lightning strike, including the fact that they can get macular degeneration if you like reading. You probably don't want to be struck by lightning. Um, they can have chronic balance problems. They can have chronic numbness, tingling, and weakness, and they can get a psychiatric illness that is nonspecific and very, very difficult to treat. Uh, lightning support families are filled with people who cannot get benefit from antidepressants, counseling, etc. The bottom line is, you get struck by lightning, there's going to be a present for you for the rest of your life. Is it worth the risk? For me personally, I just can't imagine not taking another lightning bolt shot. But on the other hand, these sorts of things are sober. Just tell them I'll call them back. I know it's the president. It's driving me crazy. It's driving me crazy. Tell them to watch the live stream. Let's see. Here are the three worlds. Sure, Mom, come on in. Talk to me. All right. Um, uh, a couple other things. Uh, wind. We don't usually think of, I mean, in tornadic winds. We get that, right? But, but wind. So one of the things.
things that can happen when you're out on the storm is dust and sand can blow in your eyes. I bet that's never happened to any of you. Ever. Um, and what happens is they can scratch your cornea. Well, nothing will paralyze you quicker in pain than having a corneal abrasion. For anyone who's had them, it's one of these things where you go, oh, God, shoot me now. Okay, because it's that much pain. Now, fortunately, if you're ever chasing with me, I carry my name in eye drops because I'm not stupid. <laughs> However, if you're not chasing with me, you may suffer the consequences of that. That will take you out of the chase. It will take out one of your eyes for a little while. They can lead to serious chronic injury, although not commonly. And for those of you who have a predilection to asthma, it turns out that the debris around tornadoes and thunderstorms <coughs> can cause severe asthmatic reactions um, because you're picking up all the pollens and stuff like that. So I just want you guys to be mindful if you're an asthmatic, it's probably not great to be around especially powerful tornadoes um, uh, because they can actually cause this asthmatic effect. I don't think I have to tell you that kale is bad. Just think of it as large chunks of ice dropped from the sky at terminal velocity. I mean, put it into perspective for you. Um, now, I'll briefly comment on rain. Here's some hail. You just want that hitting you in the head. So there's usually a few cases reported in the CDC annually of patients getting their head bashed in by hail. Um, if you've ever seen uh, somebody getting hit with a baseball in the head on, like, CNN. Sorry, not CNN. They don't usually do that. ESPN. One of the ends. Uh, if you ever see that, that actually tends to be slightly lower velocity than some of these stones can achieve, depending on where they're tossed from the storm. Remember that for them to grow this big, they've got to go up and down the downdraft many, up, and the updraft and downdraft many times. These things are heavy and they will hurt you. Um, so those of you who like to go into hail, I salute you. Um, we'll visit you. Um, all right. Um, rain. Um, you know I can't emphasize this enough. Rain leads to hydroplaning. We know this. When we're traveling in caravans, this is a big problem. When you're traveling through little towns, it's a big problem. So, um, and then mud, too. That's another big one. Uh, so I don't chase on dirt roads anymore. Every time I do, I make a mistake. And so like in uh, 2011, uh, Robert uh, Baylog and I were uh, <laughs> Have you ever noticed also that the hills are just, per wherever tornadoes touch down, it's just over the next hill. It's always just one hill away, so you can get over the next hill. We're cruising down the red dirt of central Oklahoma, boom, we're going down a nice little dirt path. We come over, you know, it's kind of winding hills, this sort of thing. Well, one of those hills abruptly drops precipitously, and there's two boards across a little crisp, right? So I'm airborne. Uh, and even at 30 miles an hour, I'm airborne, trying to use my steering wheel to position my car with all four wheels off the ground <laughs> to land on two boards of wood. And at 30 miles an hour, with a big ass tornado right in front of us that I was going to photograph when we got to the next hill, which was actually just a little bit of ways. So while I'm airborne, my camera uh, becomes airborne as well. It takes a quick look at me and then. Fly somewhere else in the car. So I'm like, oh god, I land miraculously with all four tires on the boards, and then I hit the next hill running, and then I think, I better tell Robert. But I can't pick up my hand ready to tell him, because it's also elsewhere in the car at this point. Um, and so then I see in my rear view mirror just a Dukes of Hazard moment, right? <laughs> <laughs> it was great. Crasco P. Coltrane! I could be up here all day. It's really possible. I got to admit, no, you guys are screwed. All right, so uh, <laughs> I can tell you all these things forever. Anyway, we both made it across the line, which is pretty miraculous. But had it been muddier, they may not have been there. Had I made, you know, navigation decisions are a big deal. And when it rains, it, it does pour. We have to be very mindful of that because it can be very dangerous. How many of you also encountered hail fog? Oh, God, hail fog will screw you up in terms of following the road. Nothing like it. It's when there's a lot of hail and when everything gets cool, you get a nice fog just out of nowhere. And you, they, it will hit you like in banks. You'll be cruising around, looking at the storm, and then boom, right there, the hail court uh, path. All right. Um, I'm, I was going to talk a little bit about what happens in tornadoes, but in respect of uh, Tim and Carl, um, uh, I want to briefly just mention that you know tornado injury is a real deal. Um, 
my experience in Java taught me several things. Um, things that I knew and things I didn't know. One of them is that everything, everything that a big tornado picks up is accelerated to tornadic speeds. Anyone who's in the periphery, even of the inflow jet, can suffer severe injury. The inflow jet is actually a pretty potent wind. RFD winds can be extraordinarily, it can be extraordinarily bad. Especially if they start picking up real debris, the RFD can be actually a really hazardous area to be, as can be in the area of the vault. Those things can be accelerated, and when I was taking care of patients in Joplin, what I found is that every patient, every patient was covered in little dust, this fine dust, which turned out to be pretty much buildings and ground and stuff like that. Much of it was embedded in the corneas and embedded in their bodies, and they were abraded, um, the skin was torn. I knew on a graphically, it, it hurts to think that our friends went there. But it's important to acknowledge there's no safe part of the tornado. And things that you don't think about, you always think about the big debris, it's not the big debris that gets you. It's everything else. Um, if your windshield goes out because you're chasing hail, and you're suddenly in a tornadic storm, you can be at the mercy of the periphery of the storm, not even the tornado proper. So I guess, you know, Dr. Doswell mentioned this, I want to share with you my experience that you have to respect these storms. And that's going to lead into my next topic we'll talk about, um, which is SDS versus actually storm addiction. Um, so, yeah, so for those of you going back home to Chicago, <coughs> Minneapolis is great. Yeah, I wish you uh, plenty of luck. Good luck with that. I'm glad you're keeping your winners there. We'll take ours here any day. Um, but this is what we're all jonesing for, right? Springtime. Yeah, man, this is what I'm looking forward to. I really, really am looking forward to getting back out there. This is the time of the year. Right? That's what I want to see. That's what I want to see. Campo, the friendliest tornado on the planet. Um, 20 minutes of not moving and showing me every single way a tornado can form. Absolutely fantastic. Chase of my lifetime. It is something enough to get addicted over. So let me first give you the medical definition of decision making. So it is a medical legal definition of capacity to make autonomous decisions, which consists of the individual understanding the benefits, the alternatives to the, to the activity, and the risks of the activity. Um, and then the recommendations of others. So many people don't make good informed decisions in chasing because they get online, they look at storm track, they think they can do it, they go out and do it, they look at videos on YouTube, they think they can do it. It takes humility to ask somebody, do you think I'm ready to chase these storms or can I chase with you? Um, and I strongly encourage other chasers to have some humility because it will save your life. And that, that does not mean being humiliated. Um, humility means knowing that you probably don't know as much as you think you need to know. Um, I continue to be humble in the fact that there are many things I still don't understand about storms, and a conference like this gives me an opportunity to learn about it. Um, so you have to have all of those four components to make an informed decision. If you're not asking others, are you ready, or do you understand what you're doing, or do you understand these structures of the storm, you are actually not making an informed decision about whether or not you can chase storms. Um, and that's a really fascinating thing. Um, so if you're not capable of doing that, a judge can declare you incompetent. <laughs> and I'm pursuing legal proceedings against half of you. I'll let you guess which one. <laughs> Just kidding. All right, I want to talk about chasing addiction. Because SPS, which I first heard from Steve Miller back in the 90s, when I first got started, um, was, you know, SPS, super cell deprivation syndrome, that angry, twitchy, can't wait for a storm to form, can't wait for spring, no other season matters. And that is true. A lot of us have SDS. A lot of us have had SDS. I missed out on a whole season of chasing <laughs> this past year, of course, due to health problems. So, uh, you know, I can tell you how badly I'm starting to twitch and get irritable and have GI symptoms. All right, so uh, I do suffer from SDS. But I want to talk about chasing addiction because I think if there's one disease that is likely to cause people to die in this hobby, it is this. So let's go through that a little bit. There are several tenets to addiction. The first is an inability to consistently abstain from an activity. People who cannot resist a storm 
because they know that there's a possibility of tornado and they'll chase for any reason necessary. Even if there's a good reason to stay home. Um, impairment in behavioral control, and I'll talk about that a little bit more in a moment. Um, but craving, and uh, craving is, is normal. I mean, to have some sort of desire to be in a good storm, that's a normal, healthy desire, because that's our body. But craving comes when it's not enough. The storm you were on was amazing, but there was a better storm 50 miles away. And you wish you had been able to be on that storm instead. That's craving. And craving is where you continually obsess about which storm you're going to chase, instead of just chasing and enjoying the process. That's craving. Um, diminished recognition of significant problems with finances, relationships, commitments, grades, work, etc. If you have gotten in a fight with your spouse or a significant other over chasing, just consider that that is a negative consequence. That doesn't mean it's abnormal. My wife would like me to stay home and, and, and do a lot of work. <laughs> a lot, a lot of work. And to be fair, I have skipped out on that when it comes to chasing. And that, that's not a good thing. If your grades are impacted by chasing, if your work is impacted by chasing, where you have been told if this happens again, then you could get fired, and yet you still chase, that falls into the addiction category. And then dysfunctional emotional response. Now, I have some mind questions. And again, I'm not accusing anybody of anybody, anything. I just want you guys to make an informed decision. Is this what is helpful for me? Is my self-worth based on how others perceive my success as a chaser? This is a big deal because I think that drives people to do some extreme stuff to get the best photo of the storm. That's what I think happens there. And how about, if I miss a big storm, uh, does it interfere with my ability to enjoy what's happening in the moment? I've seen posts, oh, damn it, it's my, wife, it's my wife's birthday, and I'm going to miss the storm. Okay, your wife will miss you, I'm sure, if she hands papers. What does that mean when you do that? Now, I'm not saying there's a right and a wrong, but I want to engage you in the idea that that may not be the healthiest behavior. And you need to look at it, because what it tells me is your brain is putting chasing on a pedestal that doesn't deserve. It's another part of life. It should be an interest in things you have. If you're doing it at the expense of others, it's bordering on addiction. And it's a serious disease because addiction is fatal. Um, so a bit more on behavioral control. When people spend more time and frequency spent on the activity greater than the person intended, now, this can be tough for chasing because you may chase a storm and say, I'm going to be home tomorrow. And then you chase a storm 600 miles further. Oh, okay, well now I'm not going to be home tomorrow. But if you consistently say, I'm just going to be out for four days and you're out for eight, that's an example of behavioral control problem not being able to curtail your own activity, despite the negative consequences. Um, extended time recovering from the act activity, which impinges on normal activity. How many need to recover because of all the caffeine you just and the miles driven? Need a few days to recover after a chase. If that interferes with your ability to participate in your daily living, that's a significant behavioral control issue. Uh, continuing engagement in behavior despite increasingly negative consequences. It's all laid out for you, but you don't choose to pay attention to it. And then there becomes a narrowing behavioral repertoire focused on increasingly on the rewards of the activity. Extreme chasing, in my opinion, is deadly. That Tim died, and Carl, and, son, and Tim's son, and Paul died. That, that, you know, I have to agree with Dr. Doswell, it just was the way it worked out. But that are not the chasers I worry about. I worry about what it is we're putting out on YouTube and pictures, and how important that makes other people feel about themselves. It's wonderful to get those great photos. I crave getting a great photograph. I crave it tremendously. But if I am only focusing on the reward and not recognizing that there are negative consequences, I'm actually engaging in addictive behavior. All right, and an inability to consistently and repeatedly change the behavior despite the negative consequences. You lose your wife, your girlfriend, your boyfriend. You lose your job, you fail out of school, and yet you still chase. That is definitely addiction. Um, addiction, so you know, no matter what the substance is, it's a progressive illness that leads fairly consistently to destitution, uh, to other substance disorders, and death. Now, I don't know the story of some of the suicides we've had in our community, so I'm not going to comment on that as being directly related. 
But we have lost many people to suicide, people who I care about a great deal as well. It is very possible that some of their suicidal ideation came about because of chasing, because they're not in the room. For those of you who want to be in the public eye, I salute you. It's a fickle audience, and you will disappear in time, and no one will know you were there. Can you chase for them? Can you chase because you want to be closer to your higher power? To experience the Zen of chasing. I love to chase, and I love what I get to see. And I am satisfied with what I get. Yes, I'd love to have seen all the great tornadoes this past year, but you know what? Spring's coming. It's another year. My importance is not tied up in chasing. If it is, you are risking your life because you're not able to see the problem. So consistently, when we talk about chasing, addiction is a skewed perspective of risk. People who are addicts cannot appreciate their risk that they're taking when they use drugs, alcohol, tobacco, those are forms. They minimize them. And that skewed perspective of risk really gets home to me when I watch others chase. People speeding, um, people driving on the wrong side of the road, people not taking care of themselves, all for that elusive, amazing shot. I got bad news for you. I chased back in the day when an elusive shot was worth a lot of money. You know, you got the good tornado video, I'm sure Tim Marshall can talk about this at length. You got the good tornado video, you had exposure, you had money, you had people who were going to call you every storm. Those days are gone. And that's just the reality. There are still some people who can make money chasing storms. But most of us, all you're going for is a flash in the pan, if that's your goal. Just do a gut check. Why are you chasing storms? I encourage all of you guys to think about that. If it's because you love the storms, then you're doing it for the right reasons. If you're doing it for the popularity, or to maintain a number one TV rating, or whatever else, that is addictive behavior, that is skewed risk. And it could be dangerous, it could kill you. So just take it into consideration. There's nothing, dead men don't tell tales, is the bottom line. You can't continue to take great tornado footage if you're dead. So we talked about tornado risks as being direct, uh, which are very easy to come into. Um, but there's also indirect risks. There are financial, there are social, there are legal, there are psychological and spiritual, and then there's also technical failure, my least favorite thing to happen on the road. These are all risks. Now you've been informed of the benefits, the alternatives, and the risks of chasing. I'd ask you to talk to somebody who you care about to see are you really out there for the right reasons. I want you to be out there. I want you to share these storms with me. But I also want you to live, and I want you to be happy, and I want you to live a good life. Um, and the best way to do that is to find what it is you're actually chasing storms for. That's my question. What are you chasing storms for? And if it's for others, just consider this chasing addiction. So what's the solution? All right. Oh, and I did want to mention this. Um, this is other, one of the type of indirect cost that happens with chasing storms. Is you endanger how people view our hobby. We travel through a lot of small towns. For my part, I think it's very disrespectful to treat somebody else's town as your speed room. Just a thought. Just sharing that. This is where people live. They don't view chasers very kindly at all. Oh, but mind you, we give the economy a huge boost. We're buying stuff. We're staying places. We're doing all these things. But I will tell you that the image I hear people about storm chasing when I'm out on the plains is we don't like you guys to be in around here. Partly because they don't want us to be chasing a storm in their town. That's true. But part of it is that there is a, a negative connotation about chasers. How can we, as a hobby, bring this into a respectful light? And I don't have any answers. I just ask all of you to sort of sit with that. Because chasing is not a bad hobby. It's a fantastic hobby. How we approach it matters. All right, so um, here's some self-evaluation questions. Just some quick ones for you to sort of think about. Do I minimize the risk of chasing and instead identify the reward? Am I suffering negative consequences from chasing and I still can't stop myself? Is my self-worth or self-esteem based on my success rate, the quality of my video, the frequency I give interviews or have footage air, if I were on a dry streak um, or couldn't chase at all for at least one year, what would I do with myself? What if no one saw the footage I took? What effect did that have on my self-worth? These are questions you should probably think about. 
Do I engage in other addictive behaviors? And I want to comment on this. Addiction is a broad stroke of many different behaviors. Binge drinking, doing other drugs, gambling, tobacco, caffeine. If you're addicted in one area, you're highly likely to become addicted in another. And if you are already exhibiting addictive behavior elsewhere in your life, it's worth taking a look at. All right, so what if I think I have a problem? I don't want to leave you in the problem, I want to give you the solution. And there is a solution to addiction. It doesn't mean you get cut off from storms, by the way. Um, the first is that you can't recover alone. No amount of willpower is going to help you recover from an addiction to storm chasing. Um, because if it was willpower, you would have done it already, basically. So no amount of willpower is going to help you get rid of an addiction, no matter what the addiction is. You have to go through it with somebody, and you need help. And that may sound very cliche, but it's actually very true. Um, uh, and, and, and I want you to know that many people have recovered from different kinds of addictions, and almost uniformly. The description right here is my life is much better. So much better than it was before. Because nothing's tied up in the addiction anymore. That's a big deal. Um, data do favor actually working a 12-step program, such as Alcoholics Anonymous in order to get over a form of addiction, because that's a constant look at how you can change your life. Um, and counseling, and often with an addiction specialist, is the way to go. If you are concerned that your high-risk behavior is an addiction, the best people to talk to are addiction specialists. And there are such things. Very, very clear. If you want me to talk to you, you can just call. I'm happy to talk. I don't judge you guys. I don't judge any of you who are addicts in here for the addiction. Addiction is a twisted disease. It's the only disease you can have that tells you you don't have it. But I want you guys to get help because there's another way. There's another way to live. All right. So what I want you to take away is bed bugs bad, addiction bad, caffeine bad, driving bad. But this is good. Though. This is good, right there. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. What we do, what we bring to this hobby, I couldn't be here without you guys. You guys teach me every day how to be a better chaser, get a better photo, grow as an individual. I am delighted. To be Part of this group. I'm so glad you guys are here. So I want to thank you. Um, I'll take questions either on or off depending on how much time we have. How much time do we have? A couple minutes if you have any questions. I appreciate your attention this morning. Yes? The answer to your question is 53,540 degrees Fahrenheit. <laughs> <laughs> Just so you know, 43,540 degrees Fahrenheit is what you will experience if you're struck by lightning. I appreciate that. Better to walk away more informed. This is how we work together as a team. Anybody else with a question? Thank you for your time and attention.